A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. This is Rebel Force Radio. Your source for the Force. Star Wars news and commentary. With Jason Swank and Jimmy Mack. I've seen Star Wars 500 times. Star Wars number one. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I suggest we use it. Now it's time for Rebel Force Radio. We would be honored if you would join us. Well, I definitely think that uh, Jimmy Mack is right for the show. We're looking at the rundown. He goes, this is like Star Wars potpourri, and it sure is. You know what potpourri is. It's all the, you know, little bits of flowers and various herbs and things that are very disparate, very different from one another, but you put them together and, oh, it just smells so good. And that's what this week's episode of Rebel Force Radio is all about, smelling good, having a good time yeah various smells coming up uh anyway great to be back with you for more rebel force radio we are your source for the force and oh so much more yeah got uh quite a few things to get through this week so uh strap in if you're joining us and uh you're new to the program maybe you found us through the bad batch after shows those have been a lot of fun to do and we are picking up new faces, new names coming in our way by uh, you all listening to that. So if you're new to the program, introductions may be in order. My name is Jason, and with me, as the aforementioned, my good friend and yours from Chicago, Jimmy Mack. Hey, Jason. Hey, Star Wars fans. Yeah, it's a potpourri, all right, here on 420, the day this podcast <laughs> drops. 420, I, I guess Poe would be pronounced pot in potpourri, flowers and herbs, <laughs> all that stuff Jason was talking about. Was crazy. More on that later. Yes. But first, uh, oh, gosh, I can't even think straight because of the earworm that's been going through my head for days now. Buckle, Buckle up, up, baby. baby. <laughs> <laughs> We're going on a ride. I mean, come on. I can't be the only one, right? Yeah, you're all welcome for that. Buckle up, baby. That that, that was epic. I think that was uh, Puppet Lando's most epic oh. recording studio visit of all time. Buckle up, yeah, baby. And I, I've heard that he's getting a lot more particular about what happens in the booth, in the studio. The, he's a, he wants a certain number now of, of, uh, of, of orchestra members, musicians there. He's really... Yeah, he's t- really taking control, like Sinatra did of those epic recording uh, sessions back in the day. Oh, yeah. He's definitely the Sinatra of puppets. Puppet <laughs> Lando. Oh, man. So much. Hey, remember when I took Puppet Lando to Rancho Obi-Wan? <laughs> oh, I sure do. I sure do. And Steve Sansweet gave us a tour of uh, all the, the Lando memorabilia in that oh, yeah. great museum. <laughs> That's one of my favorite memories. I think there's one point it. where Puppet actually breaks Steve a little bit because Steve is Steve's doing it, you know, serious as a heart attack. Uh, but <laughs> I think there's one <laughs> moment where Steve just turns and locks eyes <laughs> with Puppet Lando, and you know, it's something in between a a, a, a chortle and a oh, what have I done with my life? What, what, what's going on? <laughs> But it's the it's retirement awesome. has led me to this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, I great. got the uh, I got the package though from Ranch Obi Wan. If you can oh see. oh, the, this is the up. annual. And I, I want to do an unboxing. This is the membership kit for 2024, yeah. and it just showed up in the mail. Now, what makes this interesting to me? I have not looked in here yet, but typically, the membership kit shows up in an envelope. But this is a full on package. So I'm really curious to see what's going on here. So I'm, mm. I'm cracking it open here for the first time on Rebel Force Radio. It's a, it's a inside oh, the box. There's something wrapped up in this uh, tissue paper. Look at that! So, uh, you got the deluxe membership here. kit. You know they they go to extra care to uh, make sure everything. Wow! It's 
There's a lot more in this membership kit than I've seen in, in them for a, a long time. Uh, you have um, oh, a great Rancho Obi-Wan keychain. Look at that. Oh, for the anniversary, that's the uh, ten, their 10-year anniversary keychain. Oh, you know what? That's so true. This is, you know what's going on here? This is actually, um, it's like a triple membership because I was not a charter member of Rancho Obi-Wan for whatever reason. I wasn't. And um, I, I must have signed up a couple years after they started offering memberships. So just recently... They uh, had a promotion where you could make a small donation to the museum and become a charter member yourself. Just ah. that somehow they have this magic machine at Ranch Obi Wan where they could turn time back. So I'm receiving membership kits for not only 2024, but I also have them for 2012 and 2013, oh. the years prior to my actual membership. Oh, so, like, they that. did a reprint of those those uh, membership kits going back those years. That's very cool. Those actual membership kits. So, uh, I'll, I'm going to dig into the ones from the past. There's a lot of great pins in here. Um, that's the pin from 2014. Here's the pen from a uh, charter member. I get a, a charter member pin. I'll be sure to wear this. Uh, Next time I wear a suit, which will probably be in my casket. Um, <laughs> here's the membership kit for 2024. And uh, let's take a look. They always offer a great exclusive patch. This one features mm. Padawan Obi-Wan from The Phantom Menace. Yep. Taking advantage of the fact that this is the 25th anniversary of The Phantom Menace. I'm member 1492. Oh, that was a good year when Columbus yeah. sailed the ocean blue. I'm, I'm, I'm the Christopher Columbus of Star Wars fandom, so, you know, either either I'm a hero or I'm a villain, depending on your <laughs> point of view. Um, well, the Italians will love you, that's for sure. Yeah, and the Italians do love me. My wife is Italian, and I've watched Sopranos twice. Um <laughs> So this is great. You know, these guys are great. Plus, there's a, a message from Steve Sansweet himself included in the membership oh, kit. Nice. And, uh, you know, the, the membership card, which you get a new one every year. You can flash this on the street. And right. that gives you street cred. <laughs> right. I love that you're 1492. There's something, I don't know. There's something yeah, that's appropriate about that. I'll always remember that. I'd be... We'll be at a convention and we'll be trying to get in a in, in the rancho exhibit and they'll be like, What's your what's your membership number? And I'm gonna be like, 1492, 1492. I'll never forget it. Oh, maybe I shouldn't have revealed that here on the podcast. People oh, will be yeah. able to steal my membership number. <laughs> so if you are interested in becoming a member of Rancho Obi-Wan, I strongly recommend it. Go to ranchoobiwan.org and uh, tell them RFR sent you. Uh, Steve Sansweet's been telling me for years there's there's no other place people mention about hearing about Rancho Obi Wan than Rebel Force Radio, and I wear that with a badge of honor. You know, I mean, it's yeah. it's a place I'm very passionate about, and I really love it out there. I love the people. I love the passion for Star Wars that hits you upside the head the second you walk into that place, and I strongly re recommend every fan take a tour of that really one-of-a-kind Star Wars museum in Petaluma, California. So go to RanchoObiWan.org, become a member, and like I said, tell them uh, RFR sent you. Hey, hey, I, I gotta... got something else. As long as we're doing oh. some show and tell. Swank, did you get the uh, vintage action figures? I, I broke down and bought two. I haven't you bought, bought two. I bought two. I've been buying I can see two of, of the retro vintage figures so I can have one. Yeah, it's 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 the it's the last line that I have one to open and one to keep on the card and and with one to stock, especially. one to rock. That's right. Well, this but is it's a great the Phantom set. Menace retro collection from Hasbro, and it's a box set, a Target exclusive, which you can find online at Target.com. So save the time, save yourself the gas. Target and Walmart exclusives can go one of two ways, either. If they're easy to pick up or they're yeah. impossible. Luckily right. for us, there was a lot of concern about whether this would be easy to find. I had no problem getting it. Mac had no problem getting it. So it is nope. available on the website and through the app. 
Just order it online, and it, it's filled with six individually carded action figures from the Phantom Menace, done in that that great Kenner retro style that we grew up with in the seventies. Yeah, I thought they. I were just really wanted to well pass done. along that tip to uh, action figure collectors like myself and Jason Swank that uh, it's it's readily available at Target.com. The Phantom Menace retro action figure sets. You know, I I am real susceptible to late night shopping through Instagram and Twitter and stuff like that. But I I saw oh, and yeah. sometimes it's full of regret. This one was not. I saw an ad. I did not know that this was a thing. Our our friends over at uh, Blue Milk, Jim, you remember they put that great book of oh, uh, sure. doc- chronicling the Star Wars vintage collection. Yeah. Uh yeah. it's Those fantastic. Guys are great. Well, they've got a they've got another book out, and uh, it's called the Toy Collector's Wish Book. And what they're doing there there's three planned volumes. The first volume is out now. I've pre ordered the second, the third. They're working on right now. But what it is is it's a visual history documenting the golden age of toys of the seventies, eighties, and nineties. And what they've done is they 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 give you these great. Here's the uh, Indiana Jones, the Adventures of Indiana Jones. Uh, oh, yeah. All, all the uh, great show, classic toys here. from the, yep. the 80s. They have them all laid out real nicely so you can see the accessories uh, and you know how they look, you know, minty. But each section begins with something you might see like in a old J.C. Penny or Sears catalog where they've got them all kind of laid out as if you're about to sit down and play with them in the backyard and, you know, you got mm. the, the dirt and all that stuff. But anyway, really, really cool because... It does give you that feeling like you had looking through the old J.C. Penney catalogs and the Sears catalogs. But then they do these great close-ups. And this book covers toy lines, like I said, Indiana Jones, the A-Team, Rambo, even goes up into the 90s with the Robin Hood Prince of Thieves. And here's what's real cool about the Robin Hood is yes. that they break down and show you how Kenner made these figures by oh, kit bashing crazy. Star Wars and the old superpowers action figures. And that's how they came. So they actually give you the formula of how they made it. There's um, old Friar Tuck there with uh, the Gamorrean guard. Yeah. So anyway, uh, Rich, uh, you know, I, I just, I, I bought it. So this is not, you know, me saying, oh, I got a free book from the guys at Blue Milk. I, I paid my own money. I didn't email them and ask for a copy. And then Rich sent me a really nice note, uh, Rich a lot, saying thank you for your continued support. We 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 hope you love the Wish Book and um, got the second volume on pre order. So no, it's not Star Wars, but if you love toys from the seventies, eighties, and nineties, and you like just sitting around and flipping through them, and uh, check it out, <laughs> Toy Collectors. That's wish a book. great looking book. Yeah. That photography is outstanding. Oh yeah, they do they do such a great job. So Blue Milk, what is it? Uh, BlueMilkShop.com. And you can check that out. So, all right. Yeah, I love those guys. So, uh, okay, you know, I think we uh, we still have a little bit more uh, housekeeping here to do. A few announcements we want to make right here up at the front of the show. No weekly RFR next week. Show's going on spring break. Eh, maybe it's a little later than, hey, it's still spring, so it counts. Show's going on spring break. So that means no weekly RFR next week. And most importantly, no Bad Batch after show live next week. So we're not, but we're not going to skip the episode. We'll be back for the Bad Batch after show on the following week on Monday. A rare RFR hitting you on Monday, April 29th. And we'll be reviewing the penultimate episode, Flash Strike. So, We're not going to be, you know, combining two show reviews into one show. We're going to give each of them their appropriate time in the spotlight because there's only two episodes left. April 29th, we'll be here to review Flash Strike. And then two days after that, on Wednesday, May 1st, join us for the RFR After Show live stream as we'll be reviewing the series finale, The Calvary Has Arrived. So... It's going to be a pretty exciting week as we uh, get in both final two episodes of The Bad Batch at the beginning of the week. And then the week's going to end with RFR Live, May the 4th at the Rockwell Theater. 
And uh, that's going to be a very exciting time. So uh, we'll probably release the podcast and video early the following week, Sunday or Monday. Um, I don't think a live stream is going to happen. I don't think it can happen. Yeah. Um, there's just too many things going on with that show for us to actually live stream it. So we're going to make sure no fan is left behind, though, and we'll be presenting to you the entire show via video. Um, and it's what a show it's going to be. It's going to be a great day at uh, Star Wars Day. May the 4th be with you at downtown Bristol, where uh, it starts at 3 p.m. The art gallery below the Rockwell Theater will have artwork, comic books, and photo opportunities with your favorite Star Wars characters. Food and drinks. And uh, the Bristol Public Library will be in attendance providing giveaways and paperback books from the Star Wars universe. And they'll be going on from uh, 3 to 6. At 4 o'clock, though, we encourage everyone to go upstairs to the Rockwell Theater where we, Rebel Force Radio, will perform a live show, our first live show in front of an audience in two years. And uh, that should be filled with a lot of fun surprises. I know a lot of RFR VIPs who are well-known to the Patreon supporters from RFR Q&A Listens. The Q&A is a, a weekly show that's uh, me and an RFR VIP talking the wars. And uh, some of those uh, RFR VIPs have become MVPs to many of our Patreon supporters. They've developed their own like sub fan bases and stuff. So, and a lot of them are going to be there, plus a, a lot of uh, regular listeners and supporters of RFR. It should be a great time. I'm really encouraged by the uh, concentration of Star Wars fans slash RFR listeners in the Connecticut area. So it's our first show in the Northeast region there, and it, yeah, it should right. be outstanding. Yeah. So we'll have a lot of fun with that show. Also then following us, the Padawan Training Institute will be uh, well, that sounds training official. younglings. <laughs> What's that? The, that said, that sounds really official. The Padawan the Pad Training <laughs> Institute. It gets serious when you have an institute. It's like when you stay home sick from school and you're watching TV and you see all those commercials for the DeVry Institute or the <laughs> Truck Driver School. And then all of a yeah. sudden the Padawan Training Institute commercial comes on. And uh, they, it's a fun thing where they teach kids how to uh, saber duel and... Uh, and become one with the force, I guess. I don't know. What, but it sounds like a lot of fun. So yeah. I'm curious to catch a glimpse of that. And then at 7.30, from 7.30 to 9.30, 1980s Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back will be screened on the big screen at the Rockwell Theater. And the Rockwell Theater is a beautiful place. It's uh, freshly uh, refurbished. And it'll be the home to Rebel Force Radio and The Empire Strikes Back on May the 4th. And then once it's all over, I say we go to the hotel bar with everyone and just have a good old time. The so, after party. <laughs> yeah, the after yeah, party. Yeah, I think that's how it's going to go down, you know. I was I was thinking about a bar within the area and stuff, but I figured, hey, let's just roll back to the hotel. Yes. Most people from out of town will be staying there, and it'll just be easier and we won't have to waste time driving somewhere or whatever so right, let's just uh, let's just do it that way plus our friends at high adventure the uh, pop culture rock band who uh, have played conventions all over the world they'll be joining us on stage for the entire show glenn nelson and his gang of musical misfits will be on stage <laughs> playing uh, some of their original material that's inspired by Star Wars and actual music from the Star Wars saga. So uh, looking forward to reuniting with Glenn. I know Kevin Lyle will be there and uh, Baby Belushi. Uh, so it's going to be a, a great time, a huge Star Wars fest, a celebration of Star Wars. Star Wars Day, may the 4th be with you at Downtown Live in Bristol, Connecticut. Do not miss it. All right. Well, let's uh, let's talk about the day that is 420. And uh, you know, I, I'm not going to say that I, that I'm square um, because I I've probably um, <clears throat> I'm not bragging, 
but I've probably spilled more uh, than most of you have ever uh, drank in your life. But when it comes to when it comes to the devil's lettuce, when it comes to uh, the Mary Jane, I I am uh, I am somewhat a stranger. So the 420 phenomenon, I've been aware of it for, you know, since I was in high school, you know, because the teacher would say, um, okay, uh, today uh, in a 420, and the kids would be like, <laughs> 420, yeah, she said 420. Oh, no kidding. Oh, yeah, 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 they would snicker and all that. So I was aware, but uh, Jim, uh, this day is, uh, is a holy day uh, for those that uh, worship the leaf <laughs> and... <laughs> Uh, so what does it have to do with Star Wars? That's well, what that's what asking. we always look for here on Rebel <laughs> Force Radio, you know? Is there a Star Wars tie-in? If, if there's not, then we don't care. But, I mean, I just had to share this with everyone on 420. <laughs> because <laughs> the first thing I thought of, I mean, what's the first thing you think of when you think of 420? You think of Cheech and Chong, you know? Oh, I mean, yeah, these, of course. These guys are... <laughs> You know, the counterculture legends, Cheech and John. <laughs> I said, I think there must be some Star Wars bit they did or something. And I came across this great video I never saw. It's Cheech Marin and Tommy Chong at the 1984 Oscars. And they're presenting a special achievement award to ILM's Richard Edlin, Dennis Murin, Ken Ralston, and Phil Tippett for their work on Return of the Jedi. The Academy <laughs> decided to give them this special achievement award for the visual effects. And uh, so let's, uh, you know, since it is 420, Chicha <laughs> Chong is uh, doing some Star Wars stuff. Let's tune in uh, to uh, 1984's Oscars and see how all that went down. I'd like to thank the members of the Academy, my mother and father, Chata Chela, no, no, Nana, Nini, no, no, uh, the man upstairs, Marty Pacetta, and uh, hey. my theory of life now. Once there was the no. dawn. Hey, listen, man. We didn't win these. These aren't for us. Hot chicken, man. <laughs> we didn't win? No, it's a special... Uh, the Academy, the Board of Governors have voted a special achievement award for uh, visual effects, for special visual effects. Oh, and the winner is Daryl Hannah <laughs> for, <laughs> for most tail. No, All no, right. No, no, no. <laughs> Splash no. reference. Best tail. Oh, best tail. It's for <laughs> Return of the Jedi. Return of the Jedi. <laughs> oh, that's a good movie. We should yeah. see it, man. Are they still valid at our party? Yeah, they're going to show the Jedi right here. Right here? Hey, we don't have to pay? No. I was going to wait till they come to the $2 show, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Cheech is waiting for the dollar theater to see uh, Return of the Jedi. Well, you know, I got to, I don't know this to be uh, a solid fact, but uh, I've heard rumors that those dudes back at uh, ILM, back, you know, in the day, uh, their creativity might have been fueled and aided by uh, a, a certain herb. So the fact that they're giving these dudes, <laughs> Cheech and Chong are the ones, this could be like an inside Hollywood joke. You know, George is like, yeah, have the, those two good Cheech and Chong guys uh, give these these guys an award. They'll get the message. They'll yeah, well, well, the first time I went to Skywalker Ranch, they said, all right, the main house is straight ahead, the technical building is at the left, and the victory garden is to the right. There you go. There you go. I'm like, is that Hendrix I hear? Uh, so <laughs> that leads us to our, our next uh, segment here on 420. The top seven Star Wars-inspired weed strains. Mm. There are different types of cannabis out there, and... Uh, some of them have uh, Star Wars uh, references uh, within. Some of them are actually named after Star Wars characters and situations and stuff. So, okay. Jason, I thought it would be fun if we kind of sure. ran through a, a couple of these. And um, you can uh, you can run through the list and uh, throw it to me. And, and for each strain, I will offer a, a little bit of insights to to, okay. All right. All right. To so that particular flavor. Now, if if I had my if I had my card, I could go to a dispensary, and in theory, I could I could buy one of these. Is that what is that what you're saying? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. it is legal in half the country. Right. And, right. Uh, I believe Ohio is these one of are, those states. 
name brands. <laughs> Like, name, well, you know, these are these are actual like the names of the particular cannabis plants. Ah, plants, yes. The plant. yes. Okay, the plant. I see. Okay. All right. They well, they have uh, different tastes, different they have different effects on you. Mm. Um yeah. All right. So you want me you want me to start at number one or start at number seven yeah, and count? Let's start down. at number one. Why start not? at number one. Okay. All right. We're yeah. gonna start with uh uh the OG, and I'm talking about the Skywalker OG. Skywalker OG, Jason. Skywalker OG has been putting users to sleep for over a decade. It's almost guaranteed to glue you to the couch, but your eyes don't stay open for much longer. If you're planning on running through the original trilogy in one day, save this one for the end credits. Oh, fast acting. (laughs) All right. Fast acting indeed. (laughs) Hey, you know, I got to give credit where credit is due. A lot of this stuff... uh, I, I, I scoured the internet for this information, but uh, one guy in particular, Herbert Fuego from westword.com, mm-hmm. uh, provided me with the most information. Okay. And uh, some of these words you'll hear come out of my mouth are his, not mine. Not yours. Okay. Uh, number two, uh, Jawa. Jawa. Oh, okay. So I wrote this review. Uh-huh. Jawa. Guaranteed to make your eyes glow, <laughs> or or glow red if you are off world. See, that's a deep dive. Brother. That really is. It, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. No one else could have written that. <laughs> off world, Joe. Nice. Uh, okay, number three, Death Star. Death Star. Don't forget what happened to Alderaan. Death Star will end you. Skywalker OG is fine for the clean cut guys, the clean cut hero, but consider Death Star when you feel like rooting for the bad guy. <laughs> it's a dark <laughs> side intense. strain. All right. Uh, boy, this one brings back uh, some memories. Number four, Bubba Fett. Bubba Fett. Not Boba, but Bubba. Kind of like, you know, like Bubba Shrimp. Named after our favorite intergalactic bounty hunter. Well, maybe our second favorite now, thanks to Disney+. Plus. Oh, I didn't write that. <laughs> Who would be the first favorite? I don't I don't understand that comment. <laughs> maybe maybe Bubba is the first and Boba is the second. I'm not sure what Herbert Fuego is trying to say there with that one, but that, that comes from Herbert. Wouldn't that be sad if we found out that there was another uh, there was another bad batcher that was just a just a little bit slow, an original clone of Django Fett, and his name actually was Bubba Fett, and they just didn't talk about him very much. Bubba you know, Fett? He's kind of like, yeah. Yeah, you Bubba. have the Alpha, the Omega, and the... And the Bubba. <laughs> the, the Bubba. The, the Bubba. <laughs> like, he's like, sort of like the uh, the Scooby Dumb to uh, the, the, the Bubba Fett, you know? The mm-hmm. Scooby Dumb. <laughs> All right, number five. Uh, I'm guessing that this one's probably going to be somewhat refined, although I could be wrong. This is the Princess Leia. There actually is a cannabis strain called Princess Leia. Now, I wrote this review. Princess Leia gives a new definition to the term star puffs. (laughs) Star puffs. Hello. Star puffs. I love it. I love it. I love it. All right. Got a couple more here. Mmm, the Han Solo Burger. Han Solo Burger? Who wants a Han Solo Burger? The Han Solo Burger has been successfully flying under the radar as other strains come and go. But that's what a good interstellar smuggler does. Han Solo Burger. I don't know why the burger, though. I mean, yeah, is it because you're going to be hungry afterwards? Is that... Yeah, I, so hungry you're no, gonna want a hot no mention solo of munchies in the review yeah. here from westward.com. <laughs> but uh we got one more, Jay. Okay, all right. Oh, oh sorry. That's my that's you my can cue. cue me. All right, number number seven. <laughs> the Jedi Kush. Jedi Kush, also known as Jedi OG, is a good choice for the beginning of a movie marathon because it keeps users on the light side for most of the film. <laughs> most of the film. I don't know what happens once we get into the third act, but 
That's Jedi Kush. So there you go. There, there's oh, I got your, uh, one more. I got one more. I don't oh, know how do? this was left off. Yeah, yeah. When oh, you're is this about, from your own private stash? It is. If we're talking about Star Wars and weed, I think we need the Howie weed. Can we get the Howie weed? Oh, Howie weed. How we the weed. ILM special effects <laughs> artists who portrayed the Wampa in the 1997 special edition. Okay, of Empire I found Strikes that Bay. because I was searching for Star Wars and weed, and boy, it was the first thing that came up. Believe it or not, how we how weed. we weed. And I love that how he signs his autograph. Grr. How we Grr. weed. <laughs> All right. Well, well, it's RFR 420, giving new meaning to the term High Republic. It's uh, Rebel Force Radio here with our uh, review of 420 and Star Wars. Smoking a bowl with my main man, Vader. Can't find the lighter than use the lightsaber. Rebel Force Radio. You must contact me. Play back the entire message. What message? Message, Doctor. The message. The Emperor commands you to make contact with him. It's a trick. Send no reply. <laughs> Hey fellas, this is Trevor from Reno, Nevada. Hey, uh, just totally random. I had a question, um, and I'm not looking for necessarily an answer. I just thought it was kind of fun to think about. So I'm just throwing it out to you guys. What character do you think has seen the most screen time uh, out of, you know, movies, live action, animated shows? You know, just combine it all together. What character do you think has seen the most screen time? I don't know the answer. Uh, my guess would be Anakin slash Vader or Obi-Wan, but I really honestly have no idea. Um, so I don't know. I just thought it was a fun question for you guys to ponder. And yeah, may the force be with you. Hey, thanks, Trevor. I love these little puzzles. Uh, I Someone must have clocked this, but I, I feel like for we got to narrow it, narrow the scope down. Did he say, I can't remember if Trevor said, did, is he counting the animated series uh, or just live action oh. or is it the whole ball of wax? Well, if you count the animated series, then we're, yeah, if, that's going to be a really tough question to answer. I think if we're talking about the nine canonical films, my guess is R2-D2. Ah, what a great guess. What a great guess. Now, my question is, uh, what if you combine Anakin Skywalker and Darth Vader? And Darth Vader in the yeah. nine canonical films. Well, yeah, it, because even though R2 is there, you know, R2, there's a lot of shots where they cut to R2. He has a lot of reaction and stuff like that, but it's not like he has lines and lines and lines of dialogue. So if we're looking at actual mm -hmm. screen time, the amount of time the character's on the screen, yeah, I would be, if you're going to combine, because you're going to have... Young Anakin, you're going to have Vader, you're going to have the Hayden Anakin. Yeah, that probably would be the winner, and that's what what's what Trevor said. But um, and then if you get into adding the animation, that's just going to compound it even more with the Clone Wars. I mean, how many seasons mm -hmm. of Clone Wars were there? Yeah. So, um, yeah. do you have something, Mac? Do you have a? Uh, well, I I found a graph online. And I don't have any reason to think that it's a bogus breakdown of the Star Wars characters with the most screen time. Okay. And it's all based on the films. It has nothing to do with um, the streaming series or the animated series. But, uh, uh, yeah, I, I shared the graph with you if you want to put it on the screen. We yeah, can, we can break can down do what uh, the folks at Pop Digits uh their research say that uh, it is Anakin Skywalker slash Darth Vader with two hours and 44 minutes at the top of the list, which is uh, incredible. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they're doubling down and uh, providing a, a character uh, basically with two trilogies right. to uh, fill up, you know. Kind of an unfair um, advantage, but hey, all's fair in love in Star Wars. 
So if, if you're going to take a character like that and put, place him in two trilogies where most of the rest of them only appear in one, then you'd naturally think, well, Obi-Wan Kenobi would be number two, but that's not true. Obi-Wan Kenobi comes in, comes in at number five on the list at one hour and 53 minutes. It's Han Solo with two hours and 16, 18 minutes. Wow, that the is number two surprising. Slide. That is surprising. The camera must love Han Solo. Harrison but Hans- Ford, baby. Well, but now, does I wonder if that includes the solo film? <gasps> well, I think it would have to. Wouldn't yeah, I it? think it would have but, to. Hmm. Hmm. Because I'm sitting here thinking Harrison Ford. Okay, on oh, yeah, yeah, Force Awakens, but solo. Yeah, he's in that, a lot of that. That's what gives him the slight edge over Luke Skywalker. And uh, yeah, yeah, you know, you, you also have to include the prequel or the sequels. And mm-hmm. Luke was in the sequels, which added on to his time, but not enough to catch up with Han Solo, who had his own film. Uh, Luke Skywalker comes in at number three at two hours and 13 minutes, followed by number four, Ray, at two hours and nine minutes. Makes sense. Yeah. She was the star of the uh, entire sequel trilogy. Then again, we have Obi-Wan Kenobi, number five, at one hour, 53 minutes. Chewbacca, who I would have placed higher myself. But yeah, again, I would have too. he's not a character you linger on for long right. patches of dialogue. He usually just growls in the, there's an edit, <laughs> and they cut away from him. <laughs> one hour, 19 minutes for Chewie. Placing a lot lower than I would have thought is Leia Organa at one hour, 17 minutes. Hmm. And then yeah. placing much higher than I would have thought is Finn at Finn. one hour, 14 minutes. What's going on there? Rounding out the top 10, Padme Amidala at number nine with one hour, 12 minutes, and C-3PO at number mm. 10 with one hour, 11 minutes. I would have thought he would have placed higher, and R2-D2 isn't even in the top 10. No. Oh. Yeah, that is surprising. And what we uh, what's interesting, too, is just how little... Some of these characters are separated by him. And if you look at the difference between Han's screen time and Luke's screen time, there's a difference of about five minutes. Right. And then you but got Han did have his own Yes, he did. Spin-off film. Right. And that has to be part of this equation because this list uh was obviously made around the time of uh the release of The Rise of Skywalker because we see Daisy Ridley wearing her episode nine wardrobe so oh. yeah <laughs> that's a fun question i that's that's one that I was never, a good one never thought of before and uh yeah great question all right i think we've got another one here let's do um let's do a bad batch follow-up this is ryan from australia hey guys this is ryan from australia i have a question about omega is the reason that her blood cooperates with palpatines or whatever midichlorian rich blood they're using in mount tantus is it because she's an experimentation like she was engineered for her blood to be cooperative or is the reason that her blood cooperates because she's an unaltered clone of Django fett and if it is that she's an unaltered clone could Django Fett have initially been chosen by Palpatine, the ultimate puppet master, via Count Dooku, Darth Tyrannus, who hired him as the genetic template, to be the template for not only the clone army, but essentially Palpatine's never-ending reincarnation? Is that possible? I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Thanks, guys. Love the show. Love the accent, Ryan. Love that, love that Australian accent uh, get, asking us questions about Omega. It's very appropriate. <laughs> now, I know, I know she's yeah. the, she's not Australian, but it's a, it's you know it's she, well the voice there. actress is I, or she's from New Zealand. Same yeah, I thought she was New Zealand, but it, 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 it it's it's similar, right? It's it's same for, region. Yeah, they're, they're, they're Midwest, next door neighbors. My Midwest American ears, it sounds very similar. But though this mm-hmm. is a great question because all right, so what does what is the what is the factor? that makes Omega's blood somehow able to be infused with midichlorians and for it to not fight them, for the the M count to not degrade, it maintains it. Is it the fact that there's something special about Omega's 
genetic engineering, or is it because she's an unaltered clone herself? In which case, you might assume, like our caller is, that you could just skip Omega and go right to the source of Django Fett, though he's dead um, at this point, right? Wait a minute. Yes, he's yeah. dead. Oh, yeah, he's dead light. at this point. Yeah, he's dead. He's um, gone for a few years now. This is uh, sort of a what if. Could he have just skipped all of that and just cloned, had an un, had another unaltered male clone of Django Fett and infused or infused midichlorians into Django Fett himself? Um yeah, a lot, a lot of questions. I, I don't think that at the end of the day, the answer to any of this is that Django had a high M count or Bulba has a high M count. I know that's what where, where a lot of fans want to go. Oh, that means that Boba Fett might be able to become a Jedi in Boba Fett season, book of Boba Fett season two or in a comic book or something. And I don't think that's the case. And I don't think that's the case with Django. Um, my guess is that there was something going on with Omega. I don't think that Omega is as unaltered as Bulba is. There was something else. Obviously not because she's female and Bulba Fett is male. So mm. there was something that went on in the creation of Omega that, that, that that's the deciding factor, I think, of why she's able to have her blood infused with midichlorians and we know the rest that's my guess i think you're right it's because she is genetically engineered more so than boba i think there's something very unique and special about omega that boba doesn't share with her nor Django. and i think that's the result of whatever cloning science nala say used when she created Omega. I don't know if it's actually been confirmed that it was Nala Say herself who, who created Omega, you know. She's the one who put all the ingredients together to make Omega. I don't know if that's necessarily Nala Say's doing, but I think it is. I'm pretty sure it is. She's I think essentially so too. Omega's mother, you know. Right, right. And... um and in more ways than one, in addition to creating her, she she actually raised Omega for the early years of her life. So I, I think there's something very special about her. And I think it was, it will be revealed at some point, that Palpatine was tasking the Kaminoans with the job of creating a clone that could withstand the infusion of midi chlorian rich blood perhaps his own to try to become a potential candidate for him to possess when the time came right and i think the kaminoans went on with that and they created omega but they kept her that was their their card they were keeping in their back yeah, pocket yeah. i'm with you on this one yes they wanted to leverage it's an Palpatine. insurance policy to some degree yeah, they knew what he wanted, but they weren't just going to give it to him after they'd already been, I assume, paid very handsomely to create that clone army. And their entire economic structure was based, I believe, on the creation of clones. Yes. And they were they were getting mad money from the Republic during the Clone War to maintain that army. Cloners. Yeah. Palpatine then became emperor, and he said, why am I paying for all this? I'm emperor of the galaxy. I could do whatever I want. And so he shut down the whole operation. Meanwhile, Nala Se and the Kaminoans were a little overconfident in what they had produced, what they had already been proven to be able to do, and what they could do in the future for Palpatine when the time was right to reveal Omega or reveal the science that surrounds Omega. You know, I think Omega could be replicated herself. You know, I think Nala Se has the knowledge to create another Omega if she wanted to, because that's can how I, cloning works. Can I add on to your theory a little bit? Sure. Uh, I kind of think that it, it's possible that 
Palpatine would have come to the Kaminoans under the guise of, well, I'm very concerned because we're losing Jedi left and right and we can't yeah. replenish the Jedi. You know, so the, the, the clones at that point, they needed these Jedi generals. Well, what if you could have cloned Jedi so that you could infinitely expand not just your, your rank and file troopers, but your your generals also, or that your rank and file have the abilities of your of your generals. So that might be the sales pitch that he gave the Kaminoans, perhaps. I'd be really disappointed if the Bad Batch ended and we didn't see Omega get injected with some midi chlorians, you know? Mm. And I almost feel like the characters earned that at this point through the story and everything surrounding it. Now, it could turn her into a, you know, an Inquisitor, maybe. Even. Right. <laughs> exactly. You never know. The seventh sister might have been Omega. Wouldn't that be a twist? Well, I think, I think what they're leading towards is that the seventh sister is going to be Barris Offy. Oh, I thought the seventh sister was already a character from Rebels that was voiced by... Um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Oh, um, then am I thinking of the was fourth that, sister? I don't know. Or there, or just, let's just say a sister. A sister. Well, we don't yeah. have to be so specific. Right. I can't keep the <laughs> we, numbers straight. I don't know second from fifth from fourth because we don't even know all of them. They just pull these numbers out of thin air. <laughs> they don't go in any kind of order. Well, couldn't have been the, the seventh sister anyway because she was of... Uh, she was kind of like an alien species. Oh, Moralian. is she like a say say tin with um, the horns? What is a Moralian? You know, I don't really, for as much as I feel like I know about Star Wars, <laughs> I get real frustrated when I read books and they only refer to characters as their species because it doesn't oh, instantly yeah. come back to me. The Moralian call... sat in the corner. I will call Ponda Baba a walrus man a million times before I call him an aqualish. Yeah. That's just the school I come from. <laughs> you know, uh, Hammerhead is a hammerhead. And yes. Name, you know, he's just he's just hammerhead. He's not an Ithorian. Right. Momon the Dawn is a hammerhead. That's just how <laughs> I look at it. I mean, but I, I know. I, I'll play along, you know. Sometimes when I read books, I like to put the book down. And say, what are they talking about? And then look it up like on some Star Wars encyclopedia right, or something right. like that. So you can create the imagery in your head that you need. Yeah. But a um, Moralin is like, um, like, well, that is a Barris Offie. Barris is a Moralian. So mm. maybe Barris does become the seventh sister. Yeah. That'd be an odd. An odd uh, twist. Well, we know it's that kind of hard to pull that we've off. Seen in the, well, I mean, we've seen in the previews for Tales of the Empire that she does fall under the tutelage of the Inquisitors. She's training with yes. the Grand Inquisitor. She's bowing before Vader. So maybe they're gonna. Maybe this is a retcon of some sort. I, I, you know what? I, I think we're on to something here. So, uh, yeah, that, that could very well be. It wouldn't be Omega becoming the seventh sister. It would clearly be Barris Offy. So that all happens on May the 4th with the Tales of the Empire. And I'm still wondering if a Tales of the Jedi Season 2 is going to actually come to fruition. I think it is. I, oh, I don't I th think I Tales of the Empire is a placeholder for Season 2 of Tales of the Jedi. I think we'll be getting both this year. Oh, you very happy oh really? Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. okay. Yes. All right. As they ramp up production on the Tales of sub-franchise. Yeah. Well, but would, we're going to get together in your that. hotel room on Saturday morning, right? We are. Absolutely. It's just you and me. We're not going to let anybody else in there with us. It's, that would be too confusing. <laughs> right, Me and right, Swank, right. We, we have very strategic discussions about... Uh, you know, all of our reviews. Yes, we yeah. always have to make sure. No, we don't have any discussions about <laughs> yeah, anything. Just, we just I never know what you're going to say till we get on the air. Right. Hey, um, I do yeah. want to say something because I saw some feedback online. Um, 
where people were saying, Jimmy hated that last Bad Batch episode. You know, the one with Omega in the cell and she's mm. trying to pick her way out mm-hmm. through the tiles and all. It's not that. It's just I feel like I'm in that place where I set my expectations maybe a little bit too high for what this series was going to provide. And now with only two episodes left, it's becoming crystal clear to me that it just it, it feels like the story has become much smaller than I thought it was going to be. When they destroyed Camino, the story was huge. I mean, right. just big, epic. And now it's become very small with Omega and these kids and the Bad Batch trying to sneak in by themselves. I thought they were going to rally the troops and it was going to lead to a big, epic battle. But it doesn't appear like we're heading in that direction. And I think during my review of this week's Bad Batch episode that I was letting a lot of that spill out of me. No. Um, you know, the, well, I mean, they're like, we're, we're at the end. I'm just... I'm sad we're at the end of this series. And I'm also frustrated with the fact that it seems like there was a bigger picture story to be told, especially as the series starts to ramp up toward the conclusion, and it's not being told. I feel like there are too many stones that haven't been turned over. I feel like there's too much potential in this series that's not being realized. And then it leads me to further frustration when I think, well, this is just setting up the next thing. And it was like my... My WrestleMania analogy I used <laughs> right. during the after show. We got to get to like, the main I, event. I want the main event. I don't want WWE Raw. Is is that's their weekly show, right? It's on Mondays. It's yeah, yeah, WWE yeah. Raw. Raw. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And 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 there's like hardly any wrestling going on on that show. It's it's all the wrestlers with microphones in the middle of the ring, you know, making threats to each other. A lot of talking. It's all a lot of setup, setup, yeah. setup, setup, setup mm-hmm. until the big pay per view event. Right. WrestleMania. I want WrestleMania with my Bad Batch series uh, finale. Heck, I'll series take Summer finale. I'll take SummerSlam. I'll take Royal Rumble. I'll take yeah, Survivor give us a cage Series. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know that's the thing. I you know I I know that everybody wants to listen to this show and our and our reviews and and it, for it to always have the same level of enthusiasm. But that's just it's just not realistic. It's not always going to happen. There's going to be episodes that stand out to us that we like, and there's going to be ones that feel like a little bit of a letdown. But if we uh, if we didn't like the show, why would we be sitting there every week <laughs> knocking out, you know, in this case, sometimes two shows a week, uh, talking about it for an hour and a half or two hours, a 22-minute episode. So we love it aw- enough to be doing this. So, But we're going to call it like we see it. And if we're disappointed. And we're also disappointed. remember, sometimes my mood will dictate my review. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's face it. The show is happening on Wednesdays, right in the middle of the week. You know, it's it's fifty fifty what you're gonna get from me. <laughs> you know, you, you might get. <laughs> I mean, come on, right? we're just people, right? But, exactly. Um, you know, I I thought it was an okay episode. I just felt like it was kind of predictable, and like I said, it felt like a very small story was being told. As I felt like. The show should be getting bigger and more expansive and leading to that that epic conclusion. I don't see the trail to epic conclusion in front of me with two episodes left. Yeah. I just don't yeah. see it. I made a comment. I said, when you were sort of describing how you felt about the episode, I'm like, yeah, you were waiting for the cavalry. And I completely forgot that the final episode is named The Cavalry Has Arrived. Yeah. So, you know, between Flash Strike, that's the name of the next episode, so what is that? Flash strike, uh, the fire erupts, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then the cavalry arrives. So I still have some hopes that we're going to see something epic there on Mount Tantus. Yeah. Um, but will it set up, or will it will it give us the the the, the Clone War that we were talking about throughout the series? Mm-hmm. Uh, doesn't seem likely, unless it is yeah. as you were saying, set up for the next the next thing. Yeah. Again, I I might have been placing too high of an expectation on what I thought they were going to do with the story, but I always say, you know, shoot for the sun. It's sure go, you know, go big or go home. And we're talking about Star Wars here. Why why do you have to, you know, hold your cards so close to your chest when there you have so many different 
eras and characters and storylines that you could just blow up and make it into a huge, amazing spectacle. But it just feels like there's a very conservative approach going to the storytelling, almost kind of a (laughs) wishy-washy, you know, when I want full commitment. Right, right, uh, right. And and blowing up was full commitment. Uh, and yes. I even think, yeah, that was full commitment. Yeah, absolutely. The, the complete erasure of uh, Geonosis and the Clone Wars was also full commitment. They were making a big statement mm-hmm. there. Um, you know what? Also, is a full commitment is the full commitment to Rebel Force Radio through Patreon. How's that for a transition? <laughs> Rebel Beautiful Force Radio segment. on Patreon never, never lets you down. It never leaves you <laughs> wanting more because there's always, always more happening with RFR over on Patreon, and it's simple, easy to get to. Just over, head over to rebelforceradio.com and click on the Patreon banner in the right rail, and, here, right rail, and here's Jimmy Mack to tell you more about what's going on right now with Rebel Force Radio on Patreon. Well, there's always so much going on. I mean, it's it's the place to get all your information first about Rebel Force Radio. It's a place to get early bird releases of shows, ad-free ad-free podcasts. It's amazing. Plus, we have a lot of exclusive programming going on over there, like the RFR Q&A. We're at episode 201, and uh, myself and RFR VIP Marty from Georgia discuss the Revenge of the Sith novelization. You know, Swank, we often recommend the novelization to that film for fans who are looking for a little bit more foundation to the story, a little bit more insight into the characters and situations. And and, and Marty from Georgia heeded our advice and uh, dug into the book and, and really had a good time reading it. So we discuss a few of his favorite moments from the book. We talk about the Bad Batch. Marty reveals to me that he has a history in fencing. You know? Oh, that's the, uh, cool. The sp- <laughs> I was like, that had to have been inspired by lightsaber duels in Star Wars. And how often were you going... <laughs> Did he fess Plus, up? You know, it I was, mean, wasn't it? It was his love of Star Wars that... Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yes. Okay. Absolutely. And you know those masks that people wear when they fence? It's just like this kind of... I don't know even how to describe it. It's like a meshy sort of silver yeah, yeah, yeah. mask they wear. It covers mm-hmm. their whole face. Yeah, it's like a He said the visibility net, yeah. inside those things is actually pretty decent, which surprised yeah. me. I always thought, how can you guys be dueling with those things covering your face? Right. But, I mean, it's like hey, a tennis you, racket. Or it's like, you know, with the blast shield down, I can't see a thing. How am I supposed to fight? So it's all about just trusting the force. <laughs> I never understood why people used to call Luke Skywalker whiny, but sometimes. <laughs> the How, am I supposed to fight? <laughs> How am I supposed to fight? <laughs> but that was all part of Mark's journey that he gave to the character. He knew that the character was going to evolve and he had to start somewhere. And I think he, uh, you know, had a lot of discussions with George. I, I would say that Mark was probably. Um, the most method guy on <laughs> on the set of Star Wars because he really needed to know backstory. And I think, you know, he's even talked about how he felt, in retrospect, he kind of annoyed George because uh, he was always asking him question and question and question and just, just play it, you know, you're, you're just be yourself, you know. Uh, but that wasn't enough for Mark. He really wanted to know how this, char- how this character was going to evolve. And, and I think he gets lots of credit, deserves lots of credit for it. Mark Hamill is an young. underrated good actor, in my opinion. Oh, he's very great. Good actor. He's a great actor. You know, I could just see, though, a young George Lucas as Mark Hamill is approaching him with some other, like, very deep question about Star Wars and while they're shooting and Mark's looking for insight and George just sees Mark coming and he just goes, <sighs> and then Mark lays the question on him. And then George tries to be enthusiastic about his answer in, in the way that George Lucas, you know, nobody shows enthusiasm like George on the set. Uh, yeah, right. Well, uh, that's just, I feel like that's George's reaction to everything. George, you just won another billion dollars. <laughs> he goes into the bathroom, he starts cutting his hair off. <laughs> Which is he was known to do when the stress was uh, 
was ratcheting up on him, he'd just sit there and cut locks of hair out and throw him in the trash can as he was writing the latest Star Wars. It ain't easy story. making movies. No. But uh, it is easy to support Rebel Force Radio at RFR on Patreon. And also there's a great community section there where you can chat with fellow RFR listeners, great Star Wars fans, and there's always great conversation going on over there. Again, full show video, bonus podcast. You never know what's going to pop into your feed when you are an RFR on Patreon supporter. So we recommend everybody who enjoys this show and enjoys Star Wars to go to patreon.com slash Rebel Force Radio and uh, show some support and get a lot of fun stuff in return. That's patreon.com slash Rebel Force Radio. I have good news for you, my lord. That's good news. Come closer, I have good news. All right. Uh, First up, this is pretty interesting. We've got some video footage of Ewan McGregor. This is courtesy of Variety. Rewatching the Obi-Wan Kenobi series. Uh, So he's he's binging his his own TV show a couple (laughs) of years after after it premiered. And he was out on the on the promotion trail. Uh, So what what brought this up? Uh, This is new stuff. Yeah, it's it's brand new stuff. Um, Variety was offering Ewan McGregor an opportunity to do a little res- retrospective on his career, and and that included rewatches of some of his biggest productions, going all the way back to Train Spotting. And uh, they sat him down and had him watch uh, Obi Wan Kenobi, and they got some insight out of him about. Uh, about what led up to the creation of the show and uh, even uh, things like uh, stuff that didn't make it to the screen in the final series. So uh, let's start off with this clip from Ewan McGregor. He's talking about um, his experience shooting the prequels and why he exhibited a sense of relief when the prequels came to an end. It's been a huge journey being part of Star Wars and for the longest time the prequels came out, there was no social media, there was no direct communication other than critics. It had been a long time since those original three films, they obviously were so important, they meant so much to so many people including myself. And so it was hard, you know, it was a big decision to do it, it certainly wasn't what I'd been doing today. It wasn't a no-brainer for me to say, oh yeah, I'll do it, I'll be Obi-Wan Kenobi, until I got nearer and nearer to getting the role and as I got closer and closer to it auditions and callbacks and then you know I can't remember how many but as I got down to the last two it had to be my role and so then to do it and the sort of excitement of it was like massive such a massive film to shoot and then for it to come out and to be sort of really panned was hard I had no experience of that that was all all a bit of a confusion so when three finished I was off I just was like See you later, and I didn't. I didn't think too much about it. You know, that's a really interesting point that he brings up. Is that so much of the fan reaction to the films, and I and I hadn't thought about this until he just said it. Because mm-hmm. I, I'm just like you and McGregor in the sense that I was also experiencing the fan reaction, but always through filtered media. Mm -hmm. always through filtered mainstream media, newspapers, radio, TV. I'm not saying that they were, that they were universally, I'm not making the case that they were universally loved when they came out, but was it really that bad? Or was it that the media just tended to focus, which it does on the negative because you know, uh, that's what sells. That's what sells. Nobody loves big puff pieces about how everybody loves a film. They'd rather write a piece about, you know, how everyone is disappointed. And Mm -hmm. I can't remember anything having the hype of a return to cinemas quite like Star Wars, Time Magazine, Variety, or, you know, uh, Vanity Fair, uh, Entertainment Weekly. They were all clamoring. And, you know, there is something to be said about how the media likes to build things up so that they can tear it down. Again, yeah. not making the case that uh, it was universally loved, but was the hatred as raw and rough and real as what Ewan was experiencing through those through the critics? Maybe not. 
Well, something that I think Ewan is conveniently leaving out of his discussion is the fact that he might have been a little bit disappointed as a Star Wars fan with the prequels. Oh, with the, with the, with the movies themselves. Yes. I think that's really the core of a lot of his issues. And then the backlash that those films received didn't make things any easier for him. Yeah. You know, it would, would have been easier for him to accept if, if maybe he didn't care for it, but the hardcore fans did. But Ewan has stated many, many times that he grew up a Star Wars fan. Mm-hmm. So he had a horse in the race. <laughs> and uh, I, I think maybe he was looking for something a little bit different than what those films provided as an old school fan. And it just got amplified along the way when the critical backlash was so harsh. Um, that's something uh, Ewan never really discusses, and I, I'd love to hear him say it. I don't think it's 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 good for him to <laughs> go out and bash it. But I can tell you this, you know, age provides perspective, and I think that Ewan has a lot of perspective about his experience in Star Wars, and he recognizes what he added to the franchise and the saga and how much it means to fans. Those are big shoes for him to fill, Alec Guinness. Well, Sir okay. Alec Guinness. Where I don't remember seeing a lot of kids being interviewed and asked what they think about the prequel films at the time of their release they were talking to people who had grown up with the originals. That's where the media really focused. They weren't necessarily uh, looking for the reaction from the children of the time. So, again, it could have mm-hmm. really skewed the perception because the people that are out there going bananas for you and at these conventions, for the most part, uh, are, are a lot of them are the prequel generation. That's their yeah. Han Solo up there. That's their yeah. Luke Skywalker up there. I predicted this would happen as well. I predicted that the prequel trilogy would have a, a healthy future and that it would improve as far as public perception goes. It would improve over time. And I started noticing this, you know, 15 years ago. I started saying to myself, I, I, I think the needle is starting to move into positive direction as far as general consensus about the prequels go. Mm. I mean, some some fans can't forgive the prequels no matter how much time passes or how much perspective they yeah. they have. They're, they're, yeah. they're firmly locked in, in their position. Don't forget about the uh, difference that the Clone Wars animated series had when it comes to that perspective as well. Yes. For some fans, I think more fans like of our generation. And I I think it's been healthy for the fan base to be less isolated than it was during the prequel era. We all come together now through things like podcasts like RFR or mm. conventions. There's there's much more of a community surrounding Star Wars and I think much more of a support system to be right. uh, to be cheerleaders for some things that have been publicly or critically bashed over the years, and and we really saw it firsthand at that last Star Wars celebration in Anaheim, the last U.S. one in Anaheim, where the Obi-Wan Kenobi series debuted there, it had its premiere there. Ewan was there at his first ever convention. Hayden was there. You could feel the bromance coming off of those guys. (laughs) And more importantly, you could feel the fan energy supporting the prequels. I'll never forget this. Right before the Kenobi premiere... They're hyping up the crowd and, you know, giving things away and playing loud music. And there's people up on stage pumping up the crowd before the event starts. And they did by applause. Who here loves the original trilogy? You know, us old guys were like, ah, yeah. <laughs> who here loves the sequel trilogy? It was, you know, 
a, Tepid. a, a good amount of applause, not anything to rival original trilogy. But mm-hmm. when they asked about the prequel trilogy, the place went nuts. Now, I don't know if that's because we were in the Kenobi premiere. Sure. And these were the actors who appeared in the, the prequels. But it sure seemed like there was a lot of love for the prequels in that room. And I would have never predicted that. And um, at least I would have never predicted it rivaling the response for the original trilogy. And it did. It did. It clearly did. And and I don't think that's lost on Ewan McGregor at all, which makes it easier for him to return to Star Wars. So here in this Vanity Fair interview, I said, I said Variety earlier. I made a mistake. Vanity Fair. You know, it's those... Those outlets with V at the beginning. It's mm. it's very confusing to this old original trilogy fan who <laughs> you know, I, I, I gotta so it know, is vanity get the fan. readers out. I gotta get the readers out, Swank, to well, be it's able on to the, see it's what on I'm the rundown about. is variety. Are you sure it's vanity fair? I'm sure it's okay. vanity fair. All right. Yes, yes. So here's you and McGregor uh, talking to Vanity Fair about returning to Star Wars. <laughs> right. It was years later that everyone starts, you know, now there's Instagram, there's Twitter, there's whatever. And every day I'm seeing people going, when are you doing another Obi-Wan? And I realized there's this like, oh, my God, there's this real desire. I I, I was surprised. And also, like, I thought it was quite funny, you know, that it was just every day. And then I was be interviewed about it all the time. The end of every interview was like, will you be playing Obi-Wan? I didn't, there was no plan, no one had ever talked to me about it. Ultimately, it got so embarrassing because I was constantly saying, yeah, I'd be up for it. And then it was like weeks of, he's up for it, he's going to do it. And, you know, everyone reading in a lot too much into what I'd said. So in the the end, I got in touch with somebody at um, Disney and we sat down in an office and 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 she just said, you're you're saying that you would like to do it again. And we just, all we want to know really is, do you mean it? And I said, I'm glad to have this opportunity to say, yes, I would love to do it again. Ah, so that's how it went down. Okay. And it was. I like uh, how he goes, I, I, I sat in somebody's office at Lucasfilm and she said, are you interested in return? Just say it was Kathy Kennedy. <laughs> right. You know? <laughs> what is it? What is some intern? Some intern <laughs> having you in there, Ewan? Uh, Tracy Canobio said, <laughs> no, it's Kathy Kennedy. Right. Let's go up the ladder here. Yeah, it was definitely, uh, definitely Kathleen Kennedy. But uh, that happens. I mean, we've been covering in Star Wars and pop culture and, and, and uh, interview highlights. Anytime a Star Wars alum shows up on a, a talk show, chat show of some sort, uh, there's always discussion about, hey, you did it once before. Is that something yeah. you might do again? And so it's it's fairly commonplace, right? I mean, they ask the same thing of John Boyega these days, or da- you know, obviously Daisy Ridley, she's going to do it, but uh, uh, Mark Hamill, you know, they all get asked this question over the years. Liam but, Neeson, Liam, <laughs> Liam, but yeah, are in you, the case of they you, say, you, hey, Liam, was, Liam, are you going to return to Star Wars? Or no, you play Qui John, you yeah, know. Yeah. They, they're not calling, you know. Well, yeah. Do you think? Do you think people would want to see? And do you think there's yeah. so too much Star Wars, Liam? It's getting a little diluted? Oh, yeah, you know. <laughs> there's too many of them now, you know, Swank. <laughs> I mean, how many movies can you have our terror in them? <laughs> you know, our terror. Our terror t tear. All right. Okay. More Ewan. <laughs> More Ewan. Oh, this is a, the best part of the Vanity Fair discussion. He talks about a discarded concept for the Kenobi series. You yeah. know, the, the series, it went through many iterations. It was going to be a feature film. It was going to be a series of films. Right. Writers came. Writers went. And um, a lot of things must have been tossed out there in these production meetings about what to do with the character. And Ewan reveals one of them here, a discarded concept for the character of Obi-Wan in the Kenobi series. The first episode used to start with me as a waiter in a bar. You know, like he's really lost his way, Obi-Wan. He's working in a bar. He's drinking too much. I got I get beaten up. People are kicking me and I'm just like taking it and then st- starting out, you know, into the night. I mean, that was our first ideas anyway. There was a draft where that's how it started. Oh, I kind of dig that. <laughs> 
Obi Wan bartending. <laughs> yeah, I getting an like occasional it. brawls. I like, It'd be like that. You know, actually, but then it adds so like, much to when he says, "This place can be a little rough." I yeah. used to bartend in it. That was the bouncer. I got my ass kicked in here by Hammerhead. <laughs> I, I think it's. But great. you know, it, his description of that it almost makes me picture Harvey Keitel in the movie Bad Lieutenant. You know, just just <laughs> yes. a, a real just. What a mess of a human being. And that might have been a little too hardcore. I think they went in a right direction. It, it provided us with a down and out Obi-Wan without making him a drunk, you know. And we know he has a pension for drinking, you know. What are you going to do? do, Master? Have a drink? Oh, <laughs> it's all in that line. You know what? That's how these Star Wars things start. Right. There's one line and all of a sudden it shows up and it shows up in Star Wars and pop culture and it just goes. And it's like, next thing you know, he's a death stick smoking, <laughs> drink, heavy drinking. No, 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 not death sticks. He told that kid to go rethink his life, you know. Oh, that's true. Elon Sleazebagano mm. is the character's name. Elon Sleazebagano. Right. Character on the nozo. I think that's the name of that character. <laughs> that's a total George Lucas yeah. name. We're gonna call him what uh, was Bad Guy. <laughs> <Yeah, really. laughs> Despicable Human Beo. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I don't All know. right. Well, I always love hearing from you and McGregor, especially these days, knowing what a big yeah. fan he is of uh, of the character and being in Star Wars. I. I know it's not the most popular opinion, but I really would like another crack at that Kenobi. I would sure, and, and, and I don't think they have to go feel the pressure to have him meeting up with Bail Organa right. or anything. I think it could be just a really interesting, fun side mission that mm -hmm. uh, you know maybe it does take him into Moss Eisley Cantina, so we can find out how and why he knows that that place can be a little rough. I mean, it, it doesn't again, it doesn't have to be. Saga changing. Right. right. It could be just a very small personal story that a very small character driven story mm -hmm. about Obi-Wan, you know, getting, uh, you know, tempted by, you know, maybe using the force for criminal things and, you know, dark sure. side stuff. And, you know, he, he largely denounces the Force, I believe. That's where the character's head is at when we first catch up to him in the beginning of the Kenobi series. And he's buried his lightsabers. He, he's not fighting the good fight anymore. Nor is he connect. Well, he does connect himself with the Force. We see him attempt to reach out to Qui-Gon Jinn early he, in the series yes, when yes. he's sitting in the cave. Um, but... Uh, I, I think there's some really interesting things you could do with an actor as great as Ewan McGregor and a character as great as Obi-Wan Kenobi and all the history that goes on between the character and the actor and his enthusiasm about it now and yeah. everything. It's not like Ewan's looking for work or anything. Right, I, right, I think right. it should be treated as something of an honor. That mm -hmm. uh, here's a guy who wants to keep contributing to the saga, keep building on the character and the stories that have been getting told. And if they uh, really were able to apply themselves and get the right voices in the writer's room and, and, and stop restricting these creatives the way they do over at Lucasfilm nowadays. Maybe with Dave Filoni in a higher position than he was in when the original Kenobi series was conceived, he could maybe provide a little bit of uh, the Filoni touch to it, uh, you know, just, just yeah. to, to sort of steep it more in the franchise and, and make the narrative feel a little more authentic. That's the thing I think we've been suffering with, with, with Star Wars recently is sometimes the narrative lacks authenticity. Mm. And that's a hard thing to define and a hard thing to... Uh, put on the table you, it's like you just have to know how to do it it's about the feels yeah and uh i i think dave filoni still possesses the feels to make great star wars but we you know we need to shoot for the stars like i said earlier we need to shoot All for right. the stars 
All right. Well, let's uh, go ahead and uh, catch up with some Star Wars and pop culture. We've had that uh, on the docket for the last few weeks, and uh, it's catch-up time. Let's have some catch-up. Metal Force Radio. You've already made that Star Wars reference. Your source for the Force. Star Wars parody! (laughs) All right. Well, you know, if you were a kid growing up in the uh, late 70s or early 80s, uh, Saturday Night Live might have been your jam, but there were other people watching uh, SCTV. I watched SCTV because of the reruns they had on Nick at Night. And it was a oh. cast. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They had Nick at Night reruns. You could watch the classic Belushi era SNL, and then it would go into an episode of SCTV. And, I mean, is pound for pound as casts go, the SCTV cast, I think, had uh, uh, rivaled any of the SNL, even the, some of the best of the SNL seasons. You're talking about Rick oh, Moranis. Absolutely. And, and Martin Short and uh, John Candy and Catherine O'Hara uh, and there was a guy on there, Joe Flaherty. And yes. uh, unfortunately, Joe Flaherty, he was always the, the, the count. You would see him and... Um, <laughs> count Floyd. Oh, count Floyd. How do, I, how do I forget Eugene Levy? Eugene Levy also on the yeah. show uh, from yeah. kids. Martin Short. Younger people know him. Yeah, Martin Short. That's where the Dave character... Dave Thomas, Rick Moranis. Right, right. Oh, yeah, Dave Thomas, of course, with one half of the McKenzie brothers with Rick Moranis. But yeah, great cast. Uh, but Joe Flaherty passed away recently, and yes. there were a lot of fans uh, sad about that. And so, Jim, you put together some kind of a little tribute here to Joe with a little bit of a Star Wars twist. Well, I didn't put this together. This all comes from tips from loyal RFR listener Mele, who uh, says, Hearing of Joe Flaherty's passing got me watching SCTV. And as he's binging those classic episodes of the show, which you can find a lot of episodes, full episodes on YouTube, it's not exactly the easiest show to access, you know, or stream SCTV. I I don't know why that is, but there are full episodes on YouTube that are readily available. And uh, Mele has been watching those and picking out the Star Wars references along the way. Uh, The first one uh, features the late, great Joe Flaherty. This is SCTV Season 3, Episode 13, original air date of December 12th, 1980. So fresh in the wake of Empire Strikes Back, Star Wars madness was everywhere. And SCTV uh, would often feature Star Wars references. And this one is Joe Flaherty playing the character of SCTV station manager, <laughs> general manager, Guy Caballero or Guy Caballero. Or Guy they Caballero, would always, yeah. They would always get tripped up when they were saying his name. Guy Caballero. 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 And he is addressing the audience because they have a very special presentation. They have acquired the latest Star Wars film, and they're going to screen it on SCTV. SCTV, of of course, was a a fictional TV station. And what we see, all the parodies we see, are the actual programming going on on (laughs) SCTV. Right. SC stands for Second City, Second City Television. And that's where a lot of these performers built up their chops, either working in Chicago or Toronto. And it was a Canadian TV show based around the Toronto Second City comedy troupe of the 70s. Joe Flaherty was a member of the cast. Here he is as Guy Caballero introducing the latest Star Wars film before it even hits theater screen somehow. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Somehow, SCTV has acquired the screening rights. And here's a uh, guy setting it up. Tonight is a very special night here at SCTV. We have acquired the rights to show you, our viewers, the complete and unedited film, which is another in the now legendary Star Wars series. It's entitled Star Wars Return to the Planet of Empires. Now, although it's not yet been released in the theaters, We have made special arrangements with the Star Wars people to show you this film. Now, I'll be honest with you, it has cost an enormous amount of money to acquire this cassette uh, film. (laughs) Uh, We'll be showing it to you uh, in its entirety, however. Now, you're probably wondering why the Star Wars people would let us have this uh, movie before it's in the theaters. Well, the answer is simple. 
they wanted to see how it uh, it looks on TV before it's seen elsewhere. <laughs> Of course, that's always part of the process. Let's put it on a, a small public access Toronto TV station just to just to kick the tires on the uh, see how it looks. on the film. Yeah, right. Oh, that's as long funny. as it looks good on Canadian television, it'll right. look good everywhere else. <laughs> that's uh, that's some pretty uh, you know you could you know you know George Lucas. Of course, he was always thinking ahead. You know, <laughs> right? Oh so, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So they take a commercial break. Uh, guy throws it to commercial, and then they come back, and they start the film. And as soon as they start the film, all these sirens go off, and the cops show up. And <laughs> as you'd expect, produ- as you would expect. If you the whole production bootlegged. is shut down. Yeah. So as Mele, RFR, loyal RFR listener Mele, is going on his SCTV binge, he comes across episode 14 of season three, and uh, there's a Siskel and Ebert parody where they review the latest Star Wars film. And it's Joe Flaherty is Gene Siskel and Dave Thomas is Roger Ebert. Siskel and Ebert, two guys I worked with uh, when they made radio appearances back in the 90s. Uh, both of them are no longer with us, sadly. Uh, they were uh, two of the best when it came to knowledge of films and and filmmaking and quality films and Really pioneers of movie reviews. Very Chicago guys, and and I I miss them and love them. But uh, this is an episode of SCTV that originally aired uh, December 19th, 1980. Oh, this is the next week after (laughs) Guy had acquired the rights to uh, Star Wars. (laughs) The return of the empire. What did he say was the return of the... (laughs) The, I forget. The return of the (laughs) empire. It was a good one. It was a good one. Um, but yeah, I mean, the hype, Jim, this is, we're talking about end of uh, of um, 1980. So the, the hype around uh, Star Wars is at a fever pitch with Empire Strikes Back just having come out and already probably rumors uh, of, uh, of the next one. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, obviously, we were all thinking ahead because of the way Empire ended with Han Solo frozen and Carbonite being taken the job of the hut. I mean, we were... We were all very nervous about the future and and really looking ahead to what the next Star Wars film is. And here's uh, Siskel and Ebert, as portrayed by on SCTV, uh, reviewing the latest Star Wars film. And uh, I, I don't think it really flies with the guy. I don't think they believe that the Star Wars producers are really putting 100% into what they're providing the audience anymore. I, I, I think they got to a place where they stopped caring. And you'll see why here in this next clip. All right, here's our first film. As I was saying, it's from 20th Century Fox. It's another in the Star Wars series. And this one's entitled Empires Are a Girl's Best Friend. Now, they claim this cost $50 million to make, so let's take a look at it. <laughs> we have a 1970s... Kenner Star Wars toys being pulled on wires, <laughs> going in battle against ships from the Buck Rogers TV show. Oh, there's a Klingon battle cruiser. <laughs> wow. Universes collide here. That is the cheapest space fight I've ever seen. It must have blown the entire budget on personal expenses on this one. I think this is the worst <laughs> Star Wars I've ever seen. It just stinks, and I give it a zero rating. Well, you know, Roger, I agree with you 100%. It was the rottenest film I've ever seen, and I also <laughs> give it a 100% bad rating. <laughs> 100% bad rating. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm just sitting here thinking about them doing these Star Wars parodies, and it wouldn't be that much. Uh, it wouldn't be that much longer until Rick Moranis, an alum from SCTV, would find himself in the ultimate Star Wars parody. Of Spaceballs. Wow. I didn't even make that connection. That's amazing. Well, speaking of Rick Moranis, he was one half of the McKenzie brothers, the hosts of the Canadian uh, cable access show, The Great White North. And uh, this is probably the most popular bit to emerge from SCTV in all the years it was on. Uh, the Great White North, a couple of uh, hosers sitting around on a couch uh, talking uh, to the camera for about two minutes. Their show was about two minutes long every time. <laughs> and uh, they were just being very Canadian 
you know, according to them, I guess. And they, they well, they're Canadians, me, right? They were Canadian, <laughs> right? This is it. So yeah, this, this is, isn't uh, Americans making fun of Canadians. Don't don't get upset, folks. This is uh, actual Canadians. <laughs> They get the license. Rick Moranis, Dave Thomas, is Bob and Doug McKenzie, the Great White North, and uh, the, the topic of this particular episode is Star Wars. <laughs> Good day, Great White North. I'm Bob McKenzie. It's my brother Doug, and, and today's How's it going, eh? topic is Star Wars. Okay, <laughs> now when Star Wars first came out, right? Like the first one, we saw it like first day, right? And we okay, saw. Okay, I, I know how to do a phaser. One of them uh, laser guns. I know how to make a sound of that, eh? All right, do it. <laughs> Not bad, eh? Yeah. Oh, 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 he does Darth Vader. Do Darth Vader. Okay. This eh? is great. <laughs> How's it going, eh? <laughs> good, good day, eh? Good, you got any beer? Okay, so anyway, like, we're ticked off because, like, we're going to see every Star Wars, right? So why why can't we see all of them at once? Or why can't we, um, like, buy all our tickets now, right? Because by the time, like, the, the 30th one comes out, movies are going to be what? You know, six bucks, right? I don't know, eh? Could you just repeat that last part? What do you mean? The part after... Uh... Today's topic is Star Wars. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like they might be celebrating 420 or, uh, well, I think they're, in, <laughs> they're definitely imbibing sure. on the brew, eh? Uh, of course, if you like this, they did a whole movie together. It's called Strange Brew uh, with these characters, so you can check There's that out. There's a Star Wars reference in that film as well. I'm your father, Luke. Give in to the dark side of the force, you knob. <laughs> <laughs> That's sure, eh? I haven't seen in a long time. Um, but uh, that's the Great White North, Bob and Doug McKenzie. And, you know, it, it's kind of, um, you know, forward thinking there. You know, Bob McKenzie wants to see them all at once. Why can't we yeah. see them all now? He's like, he's like, you know, the precursor of the binge generation. You know, yeah. Netflix is waiting for this guy to come along. And, yeah, let's show them all at once, you know. And, and, and meanwhile, Doug completely zoned out and forgot what they were talking about. So. <laughs> All right. Mele has one more for us. It's uh, another uh, great SCTV moment, Star Wars-inspired moment from that awesome show. This is uh, the Schmengi brothers, John Candy and um, Rick. Was it Rick Moranis? Who was the other Schmengi? Um, no, it was uh, Eugene Levy. Mm-hmm. And they were the Schmengi brothers, this polka duo from uh, the um, country of Latonia. And in this segment, they are paying tribute to fellow Latonian John Williams. I don't know. We might want to fact check John yeah. Williams and his Latonian background. But um, <laughs> according to the Schmengi brothers... John Williams is a fellow Latonian, and uh, they play some Star Wars polka music uh, in honor of him. This is uh, from Second City to SCTV, Season 5, Episode 4, original air date, November 19th, 1982. So let's turn it over to the Schmengi brothers. Can you guess where we're from when we're wearing these costumes? (laughs) We're from the other space. This is R2 and Darth Vader. And if you ain't seen the movie Star Wars, you've been living in the other space. (laughs) Stan? Star Wars was the movie that made lots of money. Some of it going to its composer, John Williams. (laughs) Whose tribute we're paying tonight. (laughs) So... Here is the music from the Star Wars. (laughs) Ow! The polka version. Wait, I'm 
impressive they could play that accordion with a Darth Vader mask. Wasn't that fun? <laughs> that wow. was fun. So, I, I, you know, I don't know. John Williams is probably spinning in his grave right now listening to that music. But I mean, Well, he's still I don't with think us. That was ex- John Williams is... <laughs> Oh yeah, right, right, right. He's what still alive, thank God. Now that you know what, that's a reference. You know, Homer Simpson said that once about J- oh. John Williams oh. supposed to be spinning his grave. And I was, you know, I, I, I guess you know, if I was a cartoon, it would have been funnier. <laughs> but uh, thanks to Mele, there's our uh, Star Wars SCTV tribute to Joe Flaherty and all the great comedians who appeared on SCTV back in the day and check it out fantastic it, Star if you Wars love, references if you made. love variety and sketch comedy TV uh, do yourself a favor hunt down some SCTV give it a yeah. give it a give it a spin there's some really great bits on there that I think still hold up and are still very very I funny think they today. do yes yeah yeah good stuff good stuff Chewy, get us out of here Aren't you glad we got out of the house and came downtown for a little culture? <laughs> They're butchering the classics. Could that bassoon have come in any more late? Oh, come on, Homer. There's lasers. You like lasers? Laser effect mirrored balls. John Williams must be rolling around in his grave. All right, well, that's going to wrap things up for us here on Rebel Force Radio. And the radio Rebel Force Radio broadcast week <laughs> this week after the Bad Batch After Show and uh, the weekly podcast, as Mac mentioned at the top of the show, remember, no new Rebel Force Radio next week. That includes the Bad Batch After Show. The Bad Batch After Show will return with its coverage of Flash Strike, the penultimate episode, episode number 14, on Monday, April 29th, the rare Monday RFR. So mark your calendars. And then we will be back on schedule Wednesday with the finale. The cavalry has arrived. And then that leads us right into May the 4th. Where we'll be in Bristol, in Bristol, Connecticut, having a great time for Star Wars Day and Star Wars Weekend. Uh, if you need more Rebel Force Radio in your life and you can't make it to Bristol, try Rebel Force Radio on Patreon. We went through a list of all the uh, fantastic perks that you can get from podcasts that you won't find anywhere else they're exclusive to patreon plus weekly full show video just think you could be watching rfr right now instead of just listening to it uh plus a great community of star wars fans that you won't you'll never find a better group uh than the patreon rebel force radio star wars fans so check that out patreon.com slash rebel force radio or go to our website at rebelforceradio.com and you'll find your way there from the patreon banner uh we're also on youtube as i mentioned you make sure that you're subscribed and you've got that notification bell giving you notifications when we do go live so that's a good reminder you get you should get an alert about a half hour before we go live so that's your clue to uh make your way to your your television or wherever you watch your youtube check it out we also have just a huge huge archive of classic bits and interviews going back more than a decade all on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Rebel Force Radio. We're also on the socials. We're on Facebook. We're on X. We're on uh, Instagram. Check us out there. The official website, as I mentioned, rebelforceradio.com. But uh, really, the best way you can help us out is just do what you're doing right now. Keep listening to the show every week, the, the after shows, the weekly podcast, and tell your friends about it. You've got the Star Wars fan in your life and they haven't discovered RFR. Tell them about us. And, uh, we appreciate that so much. Subscribe if you have a podcatcher of choice that allows you to leave a review. We love those so much. We read them all. Just one very simple rule, please. Make them good. All right, that's going to do it for us. We will see you in two weeks live in Bristol. But don't forget, two episodes of the Bad Batch After Show before then. We're out. We'll see you next time for Rebel Force Radio. I'm Jason. I'm Jimmy Mack. And remember... The Force will be with you, always.
I'm your father, Luke. Give in to the dark side of the force, you knob.